Welcome back everybody to part two of this five part video series on risk adjusted return metrics. So it's a fairly common assumption among investors that there's some inherent trade off between risk and reward. That somehow you can't have both at the same time. You can either have a safe portfolio that doesn't earn very much or you can get a higher rate of return but with a lot more risk. But the truth is this risk reward dynamic is quantifiable. We can measure it and make meaningful comparisons between different investment strategies. And this gets into what's called risk-adjusted return metrics. It's not enough to just assume that a buy-and-hold portfolio of stocks and bonds, for example, might be safer simply because the expected return is low and it's relatively inactive. Or that investing in volatility products or investing in option trading, derivatives, is somehow inherently risky because the expected return might be higher and maybe it's a little bit more active. Using risk-adjusted metrics, we can actually get a much clearer picture of what's really going on. Now, in part one of this series, I introduced the Sharpe Ratio. It's one of the more common ones used, and it's a pretty good first step because it does take into account both absolute return as well as consistency over time. But today, I want to introduce a different risk-adjusted metric, and it's called the Ulcer Performance Index. It's got a really cool name, and in my opinion, it may be the best representation of how it's actually going to feel real world when you invest in a strategy. So let's get into some details. So if you haven't seen part one of this series yet, where I broke down the Sharpe Ratio, I'll leave a link for that. But I'll also go over it really quickly again, because like I said, it is the most common one that you'll see. So the Sharpe Ratio is a simple calculation that can be done to compare different investment strategies in terms of risk. In this simple example, we've got two products. One with a 20% annual return, and the other with a 10% annual return. Now most people would say that product A has outperformed product B. Most of us are conditioned to just look at the annual return and gravitate towards the bigger numbers. So 20% is better than 10, right? But if we add in the standard deviation of these two products, which is essentially how much their returns go up and down and deviate from the mean over time, it's not so clear anymore. Product A did return more, but it's also more inconsistent. When we calculate the Sharpe Ratio, now we have a more comprehensive picture. Remember, with the Sharpe Ratio, the higher the number, the better the risk-adjusted return may be. So in this case, even though product B has a lower annual rate of return, it's been more consistent, and in the long run, it may be the better risk-adjusted investment. So the Sharpe Ratio is good, much better than just looking at a rate of return by itself, but it does have one very important drawback. When calculating the standard deviation part of that equation, it actually treats gains and losses the same. A gain of 10% is no different than a loss of 10%. They're both just deviations from the mean that will affect that ratio. But now enter the ulcer performance index. Mathematically, it's quite similar to the Sharpe ratio, but with one key difference. It only uses monthly losses in the calculation. So anytime there's a positive monthly gain, that's just considered a zero deviation. It basically just measures the depth and duration of drawdowns. And that makes sense, right? Nobody gets stressed out about positive monthly gains. It's only the negative months that concern us. Now, on a side note, I think it's a medical myth that stress causes ulcers. I think it's more to do with infection and bacteria. But that's where the name ulcer index comes from. It's the stressful negative months that we're trying to avoid. So the ulcer index only takes into account drawdowns and losses in its calculation the ones that might add stress to our life. So now I want to get into a real example. And I've used this one before because I really think it drives the point home to some of these newer investors in the volatility space. I feel like there's some people out there that may be ignoring the potential risks here. For some of them, that may just be because they're newer to investing in volatility and they weren't around when these volatility products suffered major drawdowns. The XIV, for example, has a maximum drawdown of 74% and it had a few others that were pretty large as well. For others, it could be because they're being influenced by the high absolute return that some of these volatility products have produced since they launched. But that's what this video series is about. We're trying to measure return in terms of risk to get the full picture. So now we're comparing two exchange-traded products. The SPY, which is an ETF that tracks the S&P 500 index, and the XIV, which is an ETN that tracks the S&P 500 VIX Short-Term Futures Inverse Daily Index. That's pretty tough to say, so for simplicity, it's an inverse volatility ETN. Taking a look at the performance since the XIV launched on November 30th of 2010, you can see it's returned substantially more than the SPY, putting in some good work for a 37.9% annualized rate of return. This is part of the reason why it's attracted so much attention in the last few years. 
three times higher rate of return than the S&P 500. This is clearly the better product, right? But now we'll add in the ulcer index, which is a modified standard deviation that only takes into account the negative months. Remember, those are the ones that we're trying to avoid. So clearly the XIV has had a higher absolute performance over that time frame. But it's also a lot more volatile. Remember, multiple drawdowns of 50 to 75%. So it's not so clear anymore which one of these is actually better. Now with the final calculation of the ulcer performance index, again, we have a much more comprehensive picture. Just like with the Sharpe ratio, the higher the ulcer performance index number, the better here. So we can see that despite the SPY having lower absolute performance, it's clearly been the more consistent product in the long run, and it may be a better risk-adjusted investment. Now I'm not advocating a buy and hold approach here, but what this does show is that the ulcer performance index can be used to make much more meaningful comparisons than just a rate of return by itself. And this is especially true when investing in volatility. Managing emotions and maintaining discipline through those drawdown periods is very important to long-term success. And a high ulcer performance index number may mean that we're being adequately rewarded for the risk that we're taking. This is my total portfolio solution, which is all three of my trading strategies combined into one diversified portfolio. Correctly analyzing performance means we're going to look past just the annual rate of return, and we'll focus on the risk-adjusted metrics that are much more meaningful. Notice that the ulcer performance index is about eight times higher than the Sharpe ratio. Remember, the standard deviation portion of the Sharpe ratio doesn't know the difference between wins and losses. They're just deviations from the mean. But the ulcer performance index does, and it only factors in the negative months and drawdowns in its calculation. When you see an ulcer performance index number that is substantially higher than the Sharpe ratio, you know it's because the positive winning months are actually adding to the standard deviation, which we shouldn't care about. And this is why, in my opinion, the ulcer is an improvement on the Sharpe. So hopefully this helps you when you're out there researching and trying to find the best place to invest your money. You'll look at the annual return, of course that's important, but you'll also want to look at some risk-adjusted metrics like the Sharpe ratio. The higher the number, the more consistent that fund might be. But if you really want to take it to the next level, compare the ulcer performance index number as well. In my opinion, this is going to give you the best indication of how it's actually going to feel real-time to invest in a strategy. Winning months don't cause us any stress. So if you want to sleep better at night and you want consistent long-term performance, consider looking for the highest ulcer index number you can find. In the next video, we're going to talk about maximum drawdown and why this very often overlooked metric is so important to long-term investors. So stay tuned for part three of this series. See you next time. So go ahead and click the link right here, sign up for the VTS newsletter, and when you do, you're going to get full access to all three of my trading strategies for a full two weeks absolutely free. And if you are new here, please consider subscribing to my channel. Also, if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. So go ahead and leave those in the comments section. See you next time.